I'm going to go and, and start um, asking some of the questions that have come in through the Q&A pool. Uh, first question is for uh, Dr. Sabo. Um, the question is, at what scale are these databases um, and inventories that you are that you generate or that you shared with us? Great. Um, great question. Uh, the current EPA inventories are assembled at the Huck 8 scale, which is around 1,800 square kilometers. That's about half the size of Rhode Island. But the underlying databases that were compiled are variable in scale. So the atmospheric deposition uh, is four kilometer. Um, the livestock population and fertilizer data is uh, usually at the county to Huck 8 scale. Um, human, the human associated fluxes are uh, at the census block level. So the scales are actually quite variable. So if the Huck 8 scale is a nice summary of the <clears throat> nation's nitrogen phosphorus cycle, but if you want to try to get some finer scale data, I definitely recommend uh, going to the root databases or wait for another year or two and we'll have the uh, downscale data uh, available. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharar, a question came in for yours. Uh, can, the, can the data be used to implement a watershed by watershed management campaign? Uh, absolutely. So that's primarily the goal of this. And um, one of the key uh, considerations in trying to carry out a similar assessment uh, is uh, working closely with regulatory agencies to compile a lot of this data. So as I mentioned in the presentation, to actually target a specific watershed, uh, there are multiple stakeholders involved and different sources of nutrients. So in, in similar atmospheres, it becomes very challenging to uh, develop or generate uh, data based solely on assumptions and factors. So that requires the uh, collating data from uh, the actual producers that uh, the anonymity or the data quality has to be guaranteed, but at the same time, the data sharing and transparency has to be uh, well thought out. Let's put it this way. Um, with, with animal ag specifically in the middle of a lot of these conversations, uh, that requires uh, care in developing these watershed interventions. Um, and a lot of watersheds, um, I'll say um, in, in the state of Wisconsin and here in North Carolina, there's more and more uh, uh, ability to develop, form these work groups that involve, involve these stakeholders that uh, vet the data and come to a consensus without uh, the issue becoming uh, partisan. The, Dr. Sabo, another question. There was a couple of questions regarding you know, the animal population and production characteristics used in the model. Was uh, phosphatase or phytase considered? Uh, no, it's not considered. Um, so that's one one uh, thing that we'd be very excited to implement is uh, have these um, livestock constants uh, uh, vary over time. And now you can, um, if we know where these additives are implement, implemented for the livestock production practices, we can actually vary the constants across space and time. So, um, but to my knowledge, that that information is not readily available. So we're using a uh, specific, say, beef cow constant across the entire United States for the entire period of record. So that would be, that'd be very helpful if we can get, whole, if, you, if you guys know of a public database that's available or if we can um, point us towards a working group that can uh, provide that information, that'd be uh, a big development. Definitely. Yes, along that same line or regarding the model that you presented, how is state level mineral fertilizer distributed to the Huckates? Um, there, there's two there's two data sets uh, that are currently in the uh, that are currently in existence. Of course, you rely on state fertilizer sales data uh, provided by AFPCO, the Association of Fertilizer Production Companies. I think that's what it stands for. The um, uh, but then using but then using USDA census data, you can allocate uh, USDA um, fertilizer expenditure data. You can allocate that nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizer um, across the counties just using a weighting function. Um, 
but then there's also using that same approach, but adding one little GIS step, the International Plant Nutrition Institute, which is a nonprofit that works closely with the fertilizer industry and farmers, um, is actually um, not only the they not only allocate to a county, but they find the cropland center of that county. So the center of cropland in a county, and then just do an interpolation to try to distribute that nitrogen phosphorus across the landscape. Um, and in the future, we're hoping to apply a similar approach, but use the cropland data layer as uh, Dr. Shara has done, um, but do that across the contiguous United States. Thank you. Yeah, you answered the next question about the data source for fertilizer applications. So thank you. Great. Uh, question came, and I'll pose it to both of you. Any thoughts on how climate change is affecting changes in nutrient levels? I can start. I can. Um, uh, I'm, in terms of uh, uh, climate change. Uh, for, I guess our, our period of record is too small to uh, detect a potential effect from 2002 to 2012. Mm -hmm. um, but I know with the Chesapeake Bay uh, cleanup, uh, they've actually had to incorporate different climate change scenarios into their watershed implementation plan. So they have to consider the impacts of uh, increased precipitation or increased temperature on watershed implementation plans and the effectiveness of BMPs employed. Uh, but in terms of a climatic variability, uh, you can definitely pick up a signal from 2002 to 2012. The crop removal value is a nice example. Um, uh, ammonia emission rates uh, can also be uh, impacted by that. Um, and also, uh, depending on temperature stress, I know, and I know that every once in a while you see a headline in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, how there might be a shift of poultry production further west as the Delmarva Peninsula warms up more. So, um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of intriguing uh, applications of that. Dr. Schrar, anything to add? Um, so I, I agree with Rob, the, both in terms of the period of record and also in terms of the overlapping trends between the precipitation, increasing runoff, uh, increased temperature, increasing emissions, uh, from uh, animal storages, from crop and soils, and also looking into there, there, are, there is relative uptake in terms of productivity um, yield increases. So that, uh, in a sense, increases the nutrient removal, but uh, also the potential. So getting a net trend will be incredibly challenging with a lot of uh, margins of error around that uh, modeling effort. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sabo, was hydrologic export of phosphorus included in the estimates of legacy P? Yeah, that's an uh, uh, excellent question. Um, it is not incorporated into the legacy P equation. Um, so when you view that value, you can view that as the l maximum amount in agricultural soil. That's one reason uh, you'll see in the, uh, in the paper, and I try to say in the presentation, it's an approximation. Mm -hmm. um, but just to put the numbers in context, I think the TP export from the Mississippi River Basin is one to two kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per year, uh, which is a small fraction of these legacy pools. So the number, of course, can definitely be improved. Um, uh, yeah, it can, it, it can be improved, but I, I, the hydrologic loss aspect is uh, not going to change the number too much. 